This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week is a very special episode, number 700. I can't believe it. It just seemed like yesterday when I was uh, letting number 650 go that had featured Steve Cohen. Well, every 50, we like to have someone special uh, as our guest, although that's not to diminish anyone else who is in between those 50, because each and every one is equally important and very interesting. And I know you guys have learned a lot and enjoyed those podcasts then as well. But it's just that on the 50s, I like to have someone who perhaps is better well known with in our community. And Mike Caveney is the one who is this week's or this 700, this special milestones guest. And he is someone I figure that everyone in the world knows. He is internationally known, well-renowned raconteur who has published several books, all, I think about eight or 10 different books. Of course, he was uh, on the cover of so many magazines, you name it, Magic Magazine and Genie and Vanish and others. So he has been around for a long number of years. He and his wife, Tina Leonard, have toured the world and performing, uh, each having a, their own independent stellar acts that have been fantastic. And he also is the person who was with uh, Long Beach Mystics. Many of you have heard stories about that, as well as with the left-handed leg. And uh, he was also uh, instrumental in writing Weenie, which was a parody on Genie magazine. And we talk about that in this episode. There are so many things that we cover, golly, from soup to nuts, it seems like, all the way through here. And he has a lot of magic words to share with you because that's the name of his business is Magic Words, coincidentally, uh, as my podcast is known as The Magic Word, too. Completely coincidental. We talk about that briefly up front. Well, anyhow, this week's episode is brought to you by Poe's Magic Conference. That will be in Baltimore at the Lord Baltimore Hotel on August the 18th through the 21st. This is a special conference for anyone who is interested in bumping up your magic and making it just a little bit better. The idea of this uh, conference is to talk or, or to listen to the lectures of many of the people who are going to be there, including Peter Sam and Hiawatha and Kenton Nepper, uh, golly, so many more. And of course, the uh, lead person who is going to be our featured performer and lecturer is Jeff McBride. And uh, the whole idea, again, of this conference is to take your magic to another level. Uh, rather than just being entertaining and having some jokes and whatnot, this is just a way of making your magic strong and believable by adding more content t- and to the stories and uh, making it more believable. I think it's going to be fantastic. Looking forward to it. And again, that's uh, Poe's Magic Conference at, in Baltimore, uh, August the 18th through the 21st. We'll have a little bit more about that partway into this uh, this week's episode. Well, speaking of this week's episode, I'm going to stand out of the way here because Mike has so much to say, and this is a little bit longer than usual uh, episode because of that. So please welcome my guest this week, Mr. Mike Caveney, here on The Magic Word. It's given me tremendous pleasure today to talk with uh, someone that I've been wanting to uh, talk with for so long, and we have had some issues at, uh, in which he's been busy, or I have, or we've been traveling, uh, but we run into each other at the greatest of places, one of them in Cuba, in Havana, right. one of our, oh, my favorite places. Was fantastic. that cool or what? We'll talk about that. But uh, someone that all of you know, someone who is not just a magic collector, but he is history himself. He's written so much about history. I've got all of his magic words, which is funny. I th- you probably had the magic word force before me. I never even thought about that. Oh, that's right. Yours are magic words, though, aren't they? Or? My, I am magic words, but I think that still means you owe me some money. <laughs> Please welcome. Also, the owner of Egyptian Hall. Yes. Is that right? There we that's go. That's true. That you have then in uh, in Glendale. No, Pasadena. Pasadena, so darn close. Good thing I'm LA. here. <laughs> Since it is, uh, to double check, that's why you uh, know the history. And we're going to learn something about you. Uh, here he is, David Letterman. I'm sorry, here he is, Mike Caveney. Right. <laughs> I used to be David Letterman. I actually got mistaken for David Letterman once on an airplane. And did they ask for an autograph? No, they didn't. I guess they weren't a fan. <laughs> oh, they didn't give you a slap or something no. over it. <laughs> 
That's funny. Cuba was really great. So I want to talk then uh, about your collection and about a lot of other things. Of course, I, I love the book. Why did you decide to put everything finally in your book? Do you feel like, okay, I've kind of, I mean, I love magic comedy, and I still do some things from magic comedy with the what you had. Of course, really? the Lincoln coat hangers are great. Oh, yeah. I remember once when we were working the Magic Island. I worked with you at the Magic Island many, many years ago. And uh, and Tina, of course, was working there with you. And I was about to do, uh, at the time, they had a uh, an area that you could do parlor show. And I brought the linking rings. I was going to do that. But Invisible Ink was in the main room showroom. And they were you doing the uh, linking coat hanger. I said invisible. They were doing the linking coat hangers. And oh. I was wanting to do it. And I thought, well, obviously, they're the ones doing it. So I didn't do it. But that was just a great great trick among so many other things that you've done oh. so uh do you have any more of linking coat hangers or do you sell you know out of what those? i've never stopped selling them oh. i haven't advertised them in 30 years yeah uh it's just kind of a thing that's on the website and i've never wholesaled them because i don't want to spend all day making them making bunches and sending sending them out mm -hmm. so there they sit i can tell you for some reason uh, th and this goes back. Oh my God, I can't imagine to the s late seventies. I guess when I p decided yeah, to sell them, right. that's when I stopped performing them in my act. I sold co uh, set number one to David Copperfield, hmm. and I had a big, big old leather bound ledger book that came with Carter the Great Show. Okay, uh, and for some unknown reason, in that book I wrote uh, set number one, David Copperfield. And I wrote the, the state or the country that he was from and no, uh, set number one. And I've never stopped. It's at to uh, 1,260 some sets, but this is over, you know, 40 years, 50 years. Sure. Yeah. So it's it's amazing. It's so, one of those things that very few people probably still perform. I mean, I see them every once in a while come up in auction or something. I never see them performed. Ever. <laughs> well, I wish you would watch me. I w There's a <laughs> lot of them out there, but yeah. I think a, a lot of people have their suits hanging on them <laughs> rather than performing. <laughs> have them put up in the closet, and then probably they've yeah, been... And you can't do that with a set of linking rings. Your coat will slide right off of it. <laughs> well, unless you got a hunchback, maybe, or something. But uh, I, I think it is uh, one of the better tricks. And then, again, Magic Comedy, I was saying, was just a, a great book. And then you work with uh, Harry Allen or Harry, Harry Anderson, uh, the other A. Uh, yeah. So, and, and what was uh, Wise Guy? Wise Guy. Right. Oh, wise Guy. Because he was one of the left handed league? He was the left hand. Martin Lewis and Harry Anderson, I think, started left handed league. Martin and, Lewis was the Pipkin, Turk Pipkin. Turk Pipkin was there, Jay Johnson. Well, we're in Austin because that's where these guys were. That's right. On the street. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. They go back to Austin. Mm -hmm. um, Martin Lewis is the one that said, you know what we should do? We should publish uh, a parody of Genie Magazine <laughs> and call it Weenie. Weenie. Yeah. Well, that's all we needed. Uh -huh. And so uh, we did that. God, that was so long ago. It's unbelievable. Yeah. But I'm still proud of Weenie Magazine. I, when I read it, it still makes me laugh. We each had our own section. Uh, you know, I wrote this part and Harry wrote that part. Paul Butler did all the uh, illustrations, and he was the genie illustrator at the time. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that was Weenie. That was one of the left-handed league's great contributions to magic. Because Weenie came out first, and then they did Majoke, which was the parody of magic. Yes, it was. And that was not the same crew at all. And what did you guys think about that? Did you think that was a poor knockoff of uh, Weenie? Or what were your thoughts on that? Here's my thoughts. When Weenie came out, people started reading it, and they said, oh, man, I hope I'm in here, because that kind of meant you have arrived, if mm -hmm. they were going to poke fun at you. And and it was funny, but it wasn't nasty. And but when Majoke came out, it was nasty. Yeah. And I know uh, a very good friend of mine, a, a woman that read it and cried because she thought it was so mean. It was too mean. Yeah. And I uh, thought, well, there's the difference. Who was it that wrote Majoke? Or was that a secret? You know what? I honestly can't tell you. Um, it, it wasn't a secret, but no. I just don't remember. I remember there, because right now there's a, a website, uh, The Jerks. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is like a parody of the Jinx. Yes. And whoever this guy or gal is. He's a mystery man. A mystery man. Exactly right. So I don't, I don't, I'm not into that, but I hear that that's fantastic. It jokes. is very funny. It is very funny. Yeah. Um, and uh, as far as Weenie came around, how long, I mean, once you had the idea, was it like, did, it just wrote itself? It did not write itself. Um, you know what I mean? 
But, I mean, here's the thing. Jeannie had a great personality. And the, the, the writers that wrote in it, uh, I mean, everything was very familiar. Uh, the uh, Jeannie Speaks was Bill Larson Jr. And we all, you know, it always started as we go to press. And mm. it was typewritten. And it's what the Larson family's doing. And, uh, and the convention reports... And the ads, everybody always, the same dealers advertised in every mm -hmm. issue. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, Knights at the Magic Castle. So we just, it wasn't, we didn't have to invent a lot. The we, columns were already there as the far as. The columns were there and yeah. we just had had to write our parody version of it. I can tell you something that's funny. Uh, when we finished this, we decided, well, the people that are the experts for the past 30 years publishing genie magazine is mm -hmm. a to z printers out in riverside california okay so when we're ready and th at this time tina and i had a full out typesetting machine this was before desktop publishing hmm. so we had a photo typesetter which nobody had wow so because we were already publishing books so yeah, yeah we laid this thing out got a camera ready mm -hmm. and we took it out to a to z printers and they took one look at this and go hang on <laughs> You know, we do a magazine looks very much very similar. We said, no, no, don't worry. That's everybody's cool. They know about this. And yeah. he says, well, okay. He said, what uh, what color ink do you want on the cover? And we'd never thought about it. Was it purple? No. And so we thought, well, it's called weenie. So imagine if you took some old hot dogs mm. and ground them up and made them into ink. Okay. Nasty brown. That's Reddish. the color. That okay, we want. rusty kind of. Yeah. He said, okay, let me work on that. So he came up with this nasty, ugly brownish color wow and printed printed weenie magazine now a couple weeks later bill larson shows up with the new issue of genie magazine yeah to be printed and apparently the eben the guy at a to z printers goes i don't want to have to clean the press i'll just use the <laughs> same color for, and if you look at the date of weenie magazine uh -huh. and then go to your file of genie it's a guy from holland named ted beat is on the cover and the cover is printed in Genie of Weenie Brown. <laughs> Very cool. You got a whole new color, Weenie Brown. That's right. <laughs> so when you did put this together, did you get approval or did you go to, to Bill didn't. Larson? Or? We did not get approval. We didn't go to Bill Larson. But Peter Pitt came to us and said, I will sue you. Because um, he was the guy that wrote Knights at the Magic Castle. Before or after the magazine? No, before. Okay, okay. He so said, he knew this was in the process. He knew it was in the process okay. and he was terrified. Oh, my. He was terrified. I, I don't know why. Hmm. So he said, I need to read this before it gets printed. Give and approval. I remember Harry handled that and said, well, here's what I can tell you, Peter. You're not reading anything before anything's printed. <laughs> so it came out, and then everybody was happy, and it was mm -hmm. very funny. And it was so hilarious when we got a call uh, from Bill Larson at the Magic Castle and said, hey, could we sell these in the down at the, the gift shop? Gift shop downstairs. Yeah. So they ordered weenies and sold them at the castle. They probably sold more weenies than they did copies or circulation of, of Genie. Maybe for a while. Yeah. So uh, is that still publication, or do you find those occasionally just on eBay, or do they have any stacks of them somewhere um, hidden? Or? I don't know of any stacks. Mm -hmm. I have a very few, just a tiny handful of them, mm -hmm. and I rarely see them actually. Okay, but the ones you have are just private you don't plan on selling they're not no, on your website I'm, or anything I'm, kind of no thing. no i'm keeping those yeah right right now the left-handed leg uh now of course there's been a lot said and on this podcast and everywhere else about the long beach mystics and all of you guys growing up together and stories about that and unless you have something to add to that i think we can kind of put that to bed however is, is there some story that you remember i mean i remember you and stan a picture i've got of you guys uh, sitting over that barrel illusion uh, oh yes <laughs> Yeah, there's a, so, so the thing is, um, I did not grow up in Long Beach, California. Okay. I grew up in Arcadia, California, which, which is, is 25 miles or so from Long Beach. Okay. It's up next to Pasadena. Okay. Uh, but I knew about the Long Beach Mystics. Mm -hmm. And I actually got, would get a ride down to Long Beach to see the It's Amazing show, their annual public show. Mm -hmm. So I did get a ride down and I would see that and I would say, oh my God, these guys are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't really join yet because I didn't have a driver's license. I wasn't okay. old enough. So the next year, I'd get a ride somehow down to Long Beach. Like your mom give you a ride in or something? Or? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you who it was, actually. 
uh, there was a woodshop teacher at school. Not Les Arnold. No, no, (laughs) Les was in Long Beach. Yeah. Uh, There was a guy in Arcadia who was a woodshop teacher, and he was an IBM member. Hmm. And he said to me, hey, there's a magic show down in Long Beach. If you want to go, I'll I'll pick you up. So I'd go down with him. And uh, so I I got to see these guys in action. Yeah. And then when I turned 16, that's when I joined. Mm-hmm. So yeah, then we all became fast friends, and uh, and so Stan and I decided we would do an act together, ice skating. Well, you know, every <laughs> year we'd go to ice capades, and we decided, well, this would be fantastic. Yeah, do a magic act. Why not? Ice. You know, do you know how to skate? No, well, neither do I. Maybe we should learn. So we used to go ice skating. <laughs> it just all seemed the like time. a good idea at the time. Yeah, it seemed like a good idea. So we created this act with a substitution barrel hmm. and a duck bucket and I don't know what else, a sucker egg trick and and uh, yes, we got our ice skates and went and had our pictures taken uh, posed with the barrel in our ice skates. Well, I didn't see the ice skates. Oh, the, it, no, there's one where you can see the oh, skates. Oh, is there? Okay. Yeah, there is one. <laughs> and of course never got this act anywhere near an ice rink ever. Oh, you never performed it? N- we performed it. But not on ice? N- never on ice. So this did not inspire the ice, uh, the magic ice capades or magic capades or whatever that was called. What was that called? Magic capades? Something like magic capades. It wasn't on ice. No. Okay. No. I thought there was something. Short-lived, that... served its purpose, ha- had a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Still liked the barrel trick. Uh, Mark Kalin and Ginger are the ones that took the barrel trick and really did something with it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, it's kind of cool the way that you guys in the club would help each other and encourage people yeah. to, to uh, do something because you all came with different ideas and different backgrounds. I mean, like David Diebel and other people trying oh, to find themselves. David, you know? Diebel. David Diebel found himself. Mm-hmm. David Diebel was this tiny little kid, and uh, he was into juggling, which yeah. we thought, well, all right, so be a Long Beach mystic juggler. Yeah. And uh, he is. he still makes me laugh. And he, <laughs> very funny, very clever juggler. Well, especially when you stop and think about the issue he'd had, I think, with the nerves or something. So he had yep. to come up with some way of juggling that without. Yeah, yeah you watch his act and you would never know. Yeah. And, you know, he doesn't juggle seven clubs. He does, you know, something odd with an olive and a toothpick. Right. But it's hilarious and very. A coat hanger and a marshmallow yes, or something. exactly. Yeah. No, he's a great. He's in, he's in Germany now, I think. Uh, I always try to keep up with him. He's either in Germany or in Long Beach. Okay. He jumps back and forth. Well, he's a jogger, so he jogs yeah, back and forth. I guess right. that kind of makes right. sense then, too. And uh, there were some other people. I remember talking to Ed Alonzo just recently, and when he was a member. Never a mystic. He wasn't a mystic? Oh, okay. Take that back. He was with the juniors. Castle Junior. Castle Junior. Absolutely. And he was Castle trying to find himself in the juniors, he was saying. Yes. Mm-hmm. Castle Junior. So here's what happened. The Mystics was a powerhouse club. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I always hate to start mentioning names because I always forget <laughs> the most important people. But from Stan Allen to Les Arnold to Mark Kalin, Kevin uh, James, Kevin James, Jonathan Michael Pendragon. Weber, Pendragon was not a mystic. I thought he was later. Or you something. know what? Jonathan Pendragon was a member of the Young Sorcerers Association. Completely different. Completely different, but an amazing club. Hmm. Um, for a while, they met at Dante's Ranch out in the valley in Northridge. The Dante. The Dante's Ranch, wow. which is amazing. Um, and another member was Harry Anderson, hmm. and another member, I believe, was Paul, uh, Paul. I know Paul Green was. Oh, and then they started meeting at Joe Berg's Magic Shop on Hollywood Boulevard. So it was a cool club. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and all of those were about around the same time. And I say those mean like yeah. a junior. Uh, no. So what I was going to say was the Mystics and the Young Sorcerers were around. Uh, and then the Magic Castle said, hey, we're going to start a junior group. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, that's it. We're done. Yeah. You know, if you're a kid magician, what do you want to do? Meet at the Los Alamitos <laughs> Youth Center or go to the Magic Castle yeah. where they have the library and where they have lectures and... You see Vernon. You come on. Out. Yeah. The, it's all over. And it kind of that kind of ended it. So the, the guys huh. at the tail end of the of the mystics then... Sort of rolled over into the Castle Junior Club. Oh, is that what happened? Okay. Yeah. Did you have still some people coming in the last couple of years? Yeah, I would okay. say so. Okay. And then, then whenever they folded, they said, well, just go in. And yeah. uh, uh, what's her name was? Uh, Diana Zimmerman. Diana Zimmerman was working there Yeah, with that. started the Castle Juniors. Right. And I'll tell you what, all these years later, the Castle Juniors now um, has gotten some new leadership and is going gangbusters. Mm-hmm. Really great 
really great group. Is it still under her tutelage? Or who's? Uh, well, she's still there. I was just at a meeting a month ago, and she's there. So she's certainly very much uh, around. But they have two, actually two ex-Castle Juniors mm-hmm. who are the guys running it now. Um, who are they? Are they? Don't ask me that. Don't David the Doyle and another one. Okay. Okay. Hmm. To be inserted. To somebody had to be named later. Uh, so, uh, but but she kind of acts as Steve Barnes. Steve Barnes. Okay, yeah. I'll go with that. I don't. I, I'm, okay. I'm not a member of the juniors, so I right. <laughs> I'm a member of the seniors. And now a word from our sponsor, Poe's Magic Conference. There is a great convention coming up in Baltimore in August from the 18th through the 21st. And I have with me now one of the organizers of the convention to tell a bit more about it, Mr. Vince Wilson. Hi there, Vince. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me on again. It's a pleasure. You bet. So tell me, uh, this is going to be happening in mid-August and Baltimore. Tell me which hotel, what's happening. Yeah, it's in Baltimore City, the historic Lord Baltimore Hotel, a beautiful Art Deco hotel in the heart, the heart of Baltimore City. It's uh, August 18th to 21st, 2022. This year, it's going to be live and in person at the Lord Baltimore. And we're very excited to have as our keynote speaker, Jeff McBride, who's on the East Coast for the very first time in several years, actually, even before the pandemic. Uh, we're also honored to have, uh, you know, one of the world's greatest magicians, Peter Samuelson, the great med- uh, magic and mentalism, Ket Nepper, Sylvia Scepter, uh, uh, Karina Fenton from England, Mark Strivings, Hiawatha, et cetera, et cetera. We're, uh, and so many more wonderful magicians. Of course, Scott Wells will be there as well. I we're will very, be there. <laughs> we're very excited about that. You're expecting about 200 people or so. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it, we would have had 200 people if everything had gone according to plan in 2020. And obviously, we know what happened with that. Right. Uh, but the but we do expect numbers similar to that, especially with Jeff being there and such a great lineup of magicians and the amazing uh, opportunities that the uniqueness of theatrical magic can bring to your career. And just to be clear also, this is now called Poe's Magic Conference. Before it was uh, a bizarre... It was called convention. Bizarre Hauntings before because it, it was in Gettysburg at a haunted hotel. But we realized fairly early that that kind of confused people because is it, is, is it a haunted conference? Is it is it for people who run haunted houses or spooky ah, magicians? Right. And we wanted to offer the uh, theatrical magic uh, you know, quality to every magician. We don't want to single out just spooky performers. All of our performers and lecturers who are going to be headlining there are theatrical magicians. And you can learn a lot from that kind of level of magic. That'd be great. I'm looking forward to uh, being there and to seeing you and to learning from these other magical and mystical (laughs) magicians and like and teachers uh, like Jeff and Paul Prater and so many other guys. That's going to be great. So for those people who are interested in getting more information and registering, where can they go? PoeSMagicConference.com. That's in P-O-E-S, as in Edgar Allan Poe, P-O-E-S, MagicConference.com. Sounds great. Well, I will see you there, and I hope to see many of you listeners there as well. Thank you, Vince. I look forward to seeing you there. Now, back to our regularly scheduled podcast with Mike Caveney. So... uh, uh, have you thought about getting together? Uh, well, I know you have actually gotten together to do some shows with them, like at Colon, at Abbott's. You've had some reunion shows and that kind of thing. Wait a minute. With who? Mystics? I'm sorry. Going back to the Mystics. Uh, the Long Beach Mystics, that was amazing. Way, way back in the glory days of the Mystics, we took a show to Abbott's Get Together. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it was a bunch of teenage kids. Hmm. And we did a show one night uh, at Abbott's Get Together. And I have to say, it was a good show. I mean, we kind of cherry pick the the best and the brightest of the young mystics Mm -hmm. so it was a great show and i remember that in that audience that night was a young magician who lived and grew up in michigan who saw that young you know a bunch of guys his age and go i want a piece of that whatever those guys are drinking Mm -hmm. that's what i want and he moved from michigan after he got out of school and came out to long beach and joined the mystics it was kevin james Mm mm-hmm yeah. And so that was his impetus of coming out after seeing you guys. Absolutely. Like, That's for me. And um, and the other big, big show that we did was, and this was years later, uh, the SAM in Las Vegas, uh, Hank Morehouse said, hey, mm-hmm. you guys used to do that It's Amazing show every year. Why don't you 
do a reunion show at the SAM. Mm -hmm. So we did, and it was it was great fun. And you know, and now everybody's all grown up, and we've got lots of professional magicians in the group. Sure. So we did one last big blowout in Vegas. Didn't you do one then, maybe for Magic Live for Stan one time? Yes, we did a we did a big Mystic reunion at Magic Live. That was where I remember seeing that then. Yeah, too. yeah, right. Um, and that's whenever I think I first saw David Diebel actually perform. Yeah, was not that show? I think a lot of people saw Diebel the first time there, mm -hmm. and he was amazing. Now, um, I, before I forget it, and this is a story you recounted many times. I know in the past, and I we were talking about Colin a while ago, and when you guys were back there, and when you guys went into the wrong house, unbelievable. It, you and Mac. Okay, can you tell that story? I'm sorry for to the listeners, but I do want to back up because you don't want to miss this story. So let me see. We got to <laughs> set the scene. We got to Colin. Let me see. Tina and me and Dana Daniels and Mac King and Patrick Albanese. I may be leaving someone out, but a group of us. Mm -hmm. And they all they stick you all in one house. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, Greg Border does. He yeah. arranges for the houses for yeah, you. Yeah, sure. He arranges for the houses for the acts. Mm -hmm. So we get there, and it's already late, and the show is ending, and we say, hey, we haven't even been to our house. And they go, oh, well. <clears throat> you go down this street, you know, to the silo, and you turn right, and you go down, and there's a there's a big dip in the road. And just past that, there's a red mailbox on the left. And it says whatever it said, the na people's name on right. it. Right. That's the house. And so go into the house. The door's open. The, the door's unlocked. So that's the house. So we knew the name. We knew there's a red mailbox and the d door's unlocked. Okay. It's pouring rain. Hmm. And so before we leave the high school, a woman there says, let me draw you a map because you'll get lost. Let me draw you a map. So she, on a piece of paper, draws out a map. So off we go. And I mean, it's pounding down rain. <laughs> so we go to the silo and we turn right and we go, what? where are we supposed to go? You turn over here. You can't see anything through the rain. So finally I say, hey, wait a minute. There's a light on in that house. Let mm -hmm. me stop here. I'm going to go up and ask this lady or whoever's home if they know who, where this rich, whatever family is. Mm -hmm. So I go bang on the door and this lady, poor lady, opens the door. And I says, hey, we're trying to find a house. We don't know where we're going. And, you know, some idiot drew us this map that doesn't make any sense. And so the lady looks at the map and she looks and she goes, I drew this map. <laughs> So immediate. <laughs> yeah. Well, the map is very clear. We're just turned around. We don't know which is north and south. So she says, you're almost there. Just go right up here. You'll see the red mail. So we drive over there. There's the mailbox. Yeah. It's raining so hard. We say, Patrick, get out. Make sure the name on the mailbox is correct. Mm -hmm. So he does. We pull in. The door is unlocked. We go in. The house is a pigsty. There's dirty dishes in the sink. The, you know, the beds aren't made. And we go, what are you? You'd think they could, you know, wash the frickin', take the trash out. Right. They're expecting company. Somebody's staying I know here. it. Yeah. So is this really the right house? So we look at the mail on the counter. There's the right name on it. Yeah. All right. Okay, you two guys wash the dishes. We're going to go, you know, change the sheets and put the beds together. Mm -hmm. And we do all that. Take the trash out. There was a ceiling fan in the living room. I remember we were sitting there, and we're all relaxed out, and we've taken our shoes and socks off. And we're trying to shoot our socks up and make them land on the fly fan and spin around. When the door opens and a woman walks in. What are you doing in my house? <clears throat> and we look at her and go, what are you doing in our house? And she was livid. Hmm. You, I'm calling the police. <clears throat> Call the police. We'll have them throw you out of here. This is our house. We've paid money. So um, come to find out we're in the wrong house. Yeah. She said, no, no, you people are supposed to be in the next door house. I own the house next door. That's where you're staying, not in here. So it was a, a big, nasty mess. Oh. <clears throat> so she was furious at us, and we certainly had no love for this lady. But we were neighbors for the next five days, Yeah, you know, living in her house right next door. A little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> we recreated this entire situation scene on the show the next night. Okay. Um, <laughs> We explained what happened, and we had all the people present. We had somebody, I forget who, playing the role of the old woman that was outraged. Uh -huh. I, yeah, it was very funny. And so you had the stage strewn with crap and, yes. and dirty stuff. We did and all of to, that, yes. Even to the point where you're flipping the socks up on the fan. Well, we didn't have a ceiling fan. Okay. But 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Funny. That is uh, that's a great story. Uh, uh, Charlie Fry was not part of your group at all. He was he just was a not. friend. And so. Charlie was in the Ringling Brothers Circus way back when. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I met Charlie over in Europe. He was working in a show that Tina was in, mm-hmm. and he's just unbelievable, Charlie and Sherry. Mm-hmm. And the amazing thing about Charlie is he's an unbelievable juggler, and he's as good or better at magic. And I mean stage magic, close-up magic, you name it. He yeah, is as anybody. I, I think remarkable. he's the new Johnny Thompson. Yeah. As far as knowledge and abilities. He is the general practitioner. Of yeah. everything. Yeah, he is. Uh, it's amazing. So, um, but kind of what I was eventually leading up to is about the left-handed league. You are saying it was Martin Lewis and, of course, then Harry Anderson kind of got that going. You're left-handed, too, though. Well, that's the amazing thing. Being left-handed had nothing to do with anything. It just was a coincidence. But ironically, we kind of were all left-handed. Yeah. It just sort of worked out that way. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and there was not another project after that, or did you have uh, some... We actually did some shows together. Mm-hmm. We went to Arizona and did a show, and uh, we did a show up in Santa Barbara. We was did that a... one with Larry Wilson? No, no, no. It no. was all okay. left-handed league guys. Oh. We did one in Santa Barbara, and uh, and we would always do the great comedy club in Southern California is the Comedy and Magic Club down in Hermosa Beach. Mm, yeah. And our good friend Mike Lacey owns it. And Mike would always say, hey, if you guys want to do something, come on down. And so we would do a Halloween show there, the Bubonic Players. <laughs> and okay. uh, I'm sure that we had more fun than the audience did, but it was a a really fun thing. And we all did stuff that we didn't normally do. When I think of Martin Lewis, I also think of uh, that place up in San Francisco. Uh, Earthquake Thund- Magoons. Earthquake Magoons. Was that another magic place, or was that just a jazz club, or what was that? Well, I can tell you all about that. That was, uh, so Earthquake Magoons was owned by Turk Murphy, and it was a jazz club. It was Mm -hmm. kind of a cool San Francisco jazz place. And then uh, a couple of brothers who I think played in the band, Turk's band, um, they are the ones that, at an antique car restoration guy, they had a car in there and they went there and uh there's a story which isn't i don't think is true but the the end of the story is is that this building had a mountain of old red theatrical trunks Mm -hmm. and the guy said yeah the they're going to knock this building down and put in a parking lot or something and we got to get out of here and i called a guy and to a mover and he came and he says well to move all that stuff out of here it's going to cost you 600 bucks or something mm-hmm. and they said uh well what if we gave you 600 bucks and we hauled him out of here so the guy said great and they took him away and they opened one up and it said carter the great and they said who or what is carter the great and when they figured out that it was magic stuff mm-hmm. they said hey that ragtime piano player knows magic and they called Dick Zimmerman. Oh. And Dick Zimmerman came out and looked and he said, you have just uncovered Charles Carter's complete illusion show. Wow. And it they wasn't did, just his paper. It was actually a show. It was 20 tons of illusions, dozens and dozens of costumes, and all of the scrapbooks and photographs and contracts and wow. letters and everything. I mean, this guy never threw anything away. And it had all been in these trunks since 1936. So they said, well, this is unbelievable. And over at Turk's place, they've got a basement. What if we turn that into a little after hours place? We'll call it the magic cellar. Mm -hmm. And we'll set all these crazy props, whatever they are, up. And we can have people sitting on these old red uh, steamer trunks. And we can do close-up magic. And we can do a little platform and do some stage magic. And that was the magic cellar. And Martin lived up there the, with his mom and dad. And he was one of the first Eric guys. Lewis. Er, Eric Lewis was yeah. Martin's dad. Yeah. yeah. Great, great magician. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Martin came in and started working close up and then started doing stand up. And it became a, a cool magic hangout. Hmm. Daryl used to work there. And at the time, working in the street in San Francisco was Harry Anderson. Hmm. And amazingly, Tina Leonard uh, at that time was working the street, and she would work the uh, Renaissance Fair. And they had a Southern California fair. And she was doing mime? Yeah, doing mime. And they had a Northern Fair up in San Francisco. So she would 
go during the fair season uh, on a bus to the Northern Fair Mm -hmm. and uh, used to see Harry in the street. So she knew him way back then. And and then Harry came to the cellar and did uh, work for the first time in his life indoors Hmm. with a microphone stand in front of him. (laughs) And he's screaming into the microphone because that's all he ever (laughs) did. Sure, it's funny. And they said, Harry, relax. We can hear you. <laughs> this is amplifying your voice. So he started working indoors, and uh, and it was a great place, and then it closed. And then years later, astonishingly, I got to tell you this story. So these two brothers, Peter and Cedric Clute, owned all this stuff. Okay. And now the cellar closes, and what do you do with 20 tons of theatrical illusions? So they put them in a, stored them in a brewery up there, and... Old hippies broke into this place and stole costumes. There were Carter costumes in every antique store in our, in San Francisco. And then it got moved to another place. and So it was bad. And finally, the Kluth said, you know what? We don't need this stuff. Let's get rid of this stuff. Mm-hmm. But what are we going to do with this stuff? Well, they knew that that guy that used to scream into their microphone, Harry Anderson, by this time had become a big TV star. Yeah. Night Court. So they thought, well, Harry's got the money. Maybe he's interested in this stuff for old time's sake. So they made up like a seven-page inventory of all the illusions and all the stuff. Mm -hmm. And they faxed it to Harry's house down in L.A. And uh, his secretary was a girl named Raquel. And so Raquel told me this. She said, I'm sitting there at the desk and this endless fax comes out. She goes, what is all this stuff? You know, Carter the Great Magic Show. Right. And they had an enormous price on it. Because they thought he had money. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't know what any of this stuff was sure. or what it was worth. Worth, right. Put a huge price. So she hollers into the other room, hey, Harry, you want to buy Carter the Great's Magic Show? And she hears, no. So she takes this fax and drops it in the trash can. Goes on with her work. And then she thinks, you know something? Mike should see this fax. Mm-hmm. So she pulls it out of the wastebasket and she sticks it back in the machine and faxes it to me. And now I'm sitting at home and I go, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. This is fantastic. So I I think I happened to be talking to or with my buddy Bill Smith mm-hmm. and I said, hey Bill, you want to go to San Francisco and look at the Carter Show? And he said, yes, I do. So we went up there and we looked at all this stuff. And, um, yeah, and we we made them an offer, and they said, you know, there's nobody else making an offer. Mm-hmm. So we bought Carter's entire show. and brought For a lot less than what they were probably <clears throat> oh, yeah. waiting for. Yeah. Uh, much, much less, yeah. Um, so we brought it to L.A., and we set up all the illusions, and we photographed them. It was what an education this was. And uh, so, you know, Bill kept some things, and I kept some things, and we sold things to... Ken Klosterman and to David Copperfield and to mm-hmm. some people in Paris. and <clears throat> um, But I kept the spirit cabinet and I kept the million dollar mystery and, you know, some of my oh, well. favorite things. Which you performed at a collector. I absolutely performed both of them. It was them. on the cover of Magic <clears throat> Magazine one early yes, it years. Was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was from the jeans. Uh, the Jean, uh, what was the... Uh, the Million Dollar Mystery, invented by Walter Jeans. Walter Jeans, that you had the, uh, the, the first book that was in your first series. First book in the profile was Walter Jeans, mm-hmm. Illusioneer, and he invented this astonishing illusion. Right. Yeah. I bought that book. I oh, one you of got the first one. 500, yeah. Well, I had no idea if anybody would buy that book, <laughs> so we printed 500 of them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, and it turned into a very successful series. Yeah, uh, it, it had. Yeah. Um, and uh, about the Carter equipment, as I understand in reading your fam- fabulous book, I love the Carter book. It really inspired me. Uh, I, he did eight world tours. Seven. Seven, sorry. Uh, off by one. And he, You know, it's funny. I think if you look at maybe Charlie Reynolds' poster book, it says he did eight world tours. Huh. And, you know, Charlie wrote a few paragraphs about it, mm. and I don't know who where he got that information from. <clears throat> But I'm the guy that wrote the Carter book, and at the back of the book, there is a 30-year you Chron- know, chronology of what of, he did. of his career. Mm-hmm. And if you can find a month in there where he could have squeezed in another world tour, fine. But there, there isn't. 
He did seven trips around the world. So. But my question is, I thought he had some of his stuff sunk in the ship. So the You're equi- thinking of Nicola. Nicola had lost, okay. Nicola, ship hit a mine in Singapore Harbor, mm-hmm. and the whole show went to the bottom. Uh, and Ionia lost hers, though, too, right? No, I don't think in a ship, though. Okay. We'll, we'll know soon, as soon as Charles' book comes out. This <laughs> is Charles Green's book's here. Uh, Keller lost a show in a ship uh, a shipwreck way decades before I that. didn't remember that one. Yeah. Hmm. But no, Carter, what are, I mean, it's unbelievable in these steamships. You know, they would be at sea for weeks. Yeah. Getting from one continent to the next. It seems amazing, of course, today. Yeah. And, you know, I remember he got to Australia, you know, like, load all these trucks they were so heavy it's just unbelievable mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the spirit cabinet just the spirit cabinet prop weighs over 500 pounds not including the uh, not including the cases. the cases which are made out of you know inch and a half boards <laughs> i was gonna say is it plywood or like a not two plywood inch? just cut up trees <laughs> <laughs> so he got to australia and they have to load these things tons of stuff onto these in some case, ox carts, but later onto trucks, yeah. and haul them over to a train station, load them onto train cars, and start heading across Australia to where they're going. Mm-hmm. In the middle of Australia, the train stops. They go, what are we stopping for? Uh, the, the, the gauge of the tracks changes here in the country. So this train can't go on that track, so we have to unload everything off of this train, move it onto that train, so on this narrow gauge rail, you mm. can go the rest of the way across the country. Unbelievable. But he did it, and he was very successful, and he made a lot of money, unlike most of these guys. Is it because he was able to pack the house nope. more? or what? Why nope. was he so popular? He was not that much of a better illusionist at all. I, I wouldn't Good rank paper? Him. He had great paper, <clears throat> and he was a lawyer. So? And he constantly sued people. Oh. <laughs> he sued the Japanese government and wow. beat them. Um, so he was just a shrewd, shrewd businessman. Interesting. The Nicola book, I was just thinking, David Charvet wrote that one, though. That wasn't one of your books, David wrote a, yeah, he did write a little booklet, a nice Nicola. little glossy booklet on Nicola, yes. Right. But you had a book on Nicola also? Nope. I'm okay. still waiting for that. Um, Tad Ware has been saying that he's going to publish a Nicola book up in Minnesota for the last 30 years. Okay, because the only one I was thinking was uh, was the one that David had. Well, that's right. And yeah, uh, yeah. so the only thing kind of is David's. I've always loved that name. I named my son Nicholas, and I was thinking about naming him Nicola. I just like, and had it been a girl, it would have been um, Nicole. I just think that's a great name. I just love that. So Bill, you and Bill Smith had gone back to Earthquake Magoons and had gotten uh, split this up. Now, you and George Daly on a completely different matter. Decades later. Decade, well, it was decades later. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah. When you had heard that George Daly, or that was not George, but... Um, David Price. David Price in Nashville, correct? Well, was David it? Price passed away. Yes, but, but he had his Egyptian Hall yes. for sale. Yeah, you have seen the Egyptian Hall before, I assume. I, Egyptian Hall was started by W.W. W. Durbin in 1895 in Kenton, Ohio. Okay. And Durbin passed away, and David Price went to Kenton to see this little theater where he kept his amazing collection of stuff mm-hmm. in 1953 and bought the contents of this museum um, from the two guys that had it then, the Dowd brothers, Robert and Thomas Dowd. Mm-hmm. And uh, he hauled it back to his existing collection in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and he said that was the happiest day of his life when, when this little trailer full of stuff rolled into his place with Egyptian Hall in it. Yeah. And at that time, he then kind of started calling his collection Egyptian Hall Museum. Right. And he kept it in his house, but he also had it Well, barn, shortly, but... sometime after that, uh, David Price moved to um, Brentwood, Tennessee, outside... That's where I met him was Brentwood. Sure. And he built a new house, and he built uh, a big giant wing on this house Mm -hmm. to house his collection. Mm -hmm. And he was a man of kind of modest means, but very tenacious and very clever. And he... Organized, too. Very organized. And he bought, and he traded, and bargained, and cajoled, and begged uh, magic stuff. And he just wanted it all. He had... Like Jay Marshall. I don't want much, I just want it all. Yeah, he had unbelievable apparatus. 
He had a fantastic library. He had a great magazine collection. And he had the largest collection of magic lithographs in the world. Wow. So back in the 70s, I was doing trade shows. And I had a trade show in Nashville. And I thought, well, I'll never get closer to Brentwood than this. I should go meet this guy. Yeah. And I did. And I had a, we hit it off. And I had a great time. And we became pals. And um, so we kind of kept, kept in touch. And then after that, David uh, published that amazing book. Uh, history of magicians and uh, what magicians on the stage in America, something like something that. like that. Pictorial it? history of magicians Pictor- on mm-hmm. the stage, um, and it was illustrated with all this material from Egyptian Hall. And then David passed away, and now his son David Price the Third owned this amazing collection, mm-hmm. and uh, he was actually a circus collector, st- still is, and. Uh, he thought, boy, this museum space, I could really spread my circus stuff out in here. And he thought, you know what? I would like to find somebody that my father would approve of to mm-hmm. take this museum on. Because he was more interested in circus than magic, so he was ready to get yes. rid of the magic, basically. Yes. Mm-hmm. But he didn't want to just auction it off. Gotcha. You know, he knew this thing had been together kind of since yeah. 1895. Right. And, and his father wrote lots of articles for Genie Magazine and uh, Linking Ring and and so he was hoping to find somebody that might continue, that his father would approve Actually, of. approve of, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't know that. And my friend George Daly from Pennsylvania had never been to visit it. And I said, George, it's Mecca. Mm-hmm. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to go. We know that. And so we should go down there for one last look. So we went down to Pennsylvania and spent... Two from and Pennsylvania. A, from Pennsylvania, down to Brentwood, Tennessee, and spent two and a half days with... Uh, David Dave. Third, yeah, and it was just unbelievable. Endless, endless treasures. It was fantastic, and we're ready to leave. Sitting in the living room, saying, "Well, that was just the greatest experience, Dave. We can't thank you enough." And George said, "So, what are your plans with this?" And he and Dave he shocked us when he said, "Okay, I'll tell you what my plan is. I want you two guys to go home, talk this over, and make me an offer." And we just about fell out of our chair. And I remember saying, "Well, Dave." You know, we haven't taken any notes. We haven't taken any pictures. It's just all up in your mind. Yeah, up I here. mean, how on earth? Yeah. And I said, for instance, I peeked through that door over there, and there's a bunch of file cabinets in there. But I didn't look in them, so yeah. I don't know if they're empty. I don't know, you know, are they full of old newspapers? I don't know what's in there. Right. And he said, you'll like the file cabinets. <laughs> so George and I went home and said, well, I, we can't appraise this thing. I don't even know. Well, that was kind of, I think, what was interesting is because this was unprecedented. Uh, yes. Completely. I mean, there hadn't really been a market for posters until you and George no, no, created no. one. Is there had right? been a market. Well. There had been a market, but this was the mother load. Yeah. There had never, ever been something like this that came up for Up sale. until then, I'm guessing, what, Sotheby's are occasionally had something? Uh, posters? Swan but, Galleries might have something. Christopher had had a big auction. Okay, but still just a few, nothing like Jimmy this. Findlay over in England had oh, a big auction. Mm-hmm. So there were some things, but people knew about Egyptian Hall. and David Price was really great about letting people come and see it and visit, so sure. people knew that it was unbelievable. So we went home and said, well, we don't know what, have any idea what this is worth, but Here's how much we have in the whole world, and you can have all of it, Dave. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, well, that's a good, generous offer, but it's not quite enough. And if you could boost it up a little bit, and we said, we'll, we'll boost it up. And so we bought this thing, and we were equal partners, and we took it back to Pennsylvania, and we spent half the summer. But wait, there was more for that. As I recall in the story, is saying, but what about... Oh, my God. Yeah. The, when we got there with the truck, <laughs> this giant rental truck, it, it, I, this much I can tell you, it was the hottest day of the year, mm-hmm. and we're hauling stuff out there. And I do have pictures of this, and we are dripping with sweat. Mm-hmm. It is... Because it's just the two of you, you and George. Uh, we had one worker bee, a okay. guy that was going to drive the truck. Okay. And uh, so we're hauling this stuff out of there. Just, it was unbelievable, the amount of stuff. All the frames off the walls, and and then Dave says, "Hey, well, don't you know, save room on the truck for the attic." And we go, "The attic? What? What's in the attic?" Oh, attic's loaded. So I go up in the attic where it's forty hotter. degrees hotter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> send up more water, 
uh, and there were file cabinets in the attic just loaded. And then he says, now remember of the shed out back. We, what shed? Oh, yeah, come on out back. He hadn't even looked at the shed. I didn't know there was a shed. And there was a building out back, and it, it's got a bunch of homemade illusions in it. Uh-huh. And we, we loaded this truck to the gills, and it was unbelievable. And so, did you have an actual break or something on the way back? No, or? that was the Carter Show. Carter, okay. When the entire sh- truck with the Carter Show in it rolled over on its side on the Golden Gate Bridge. But that's a different story. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I know so many stories about you, but yeah. I'm conflating all of them. <laughs> I know. So we divided, we spent half the summer dividing this stuff up between us. Uh huh. Every day was I'll take Christmas this, you take morning. it. Yeah, yeah. We would lay all the Keller posters out, and I'd pick, and George would pick, and I would pick, and George would pick. And we said, you know, we have spent more than our life savings on mm-hmm. this, which I always say nobody should give George and I any credit for this. We bought this with our hearts. Yeah. That's it. But we had to go to our wives and say, um, Sandy, Tina, George and I have been talking about this. We would like to spend every nickel we've ever earned on this big pile of magic stuff. And astonishingly, both of them said, well... If you guys think this is a good idea, then go. Let's do it. Man, what supporty wives! Unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So uh, we and so that we knew we're going to have to have a sale. We got to get some of our money back. Sure. And we told Dave the third. We said, look, we're going to have to sell some of this stuff. Uh, we want to keep as much as we can. This isn't about making money, but uh, we got to. We're going to have to sell some. He said, my dad sold stuff all the time. He said, I hope you get all your money back. Well, that wasn't the goal. But uh, So after we would divide up, we'd have a few things left over, maybe posters that George and I already had, and we mm-hmm. could say, we're going to put this in the for sale pile. Well, we ended up with hundreds and hundreds of posters in our for sale pile and files of magazines. and We both had magazine collections and book collections. Um, so we we assembled this sale, and then we announced Egyptian Hall sale, mm-hmm. and it was just like the movie The Field of Dreams. Yeah, uh, you know, if you build it, they will come. Right. Well, that's what this was because we did this division of treasures in a friend of George's, uh, Earl Noel, had a company, <clears throat> a company that made cardboard tubes, which is ironic since we had thousands of posters. posters yeah, perfect. What a marriage. <laughs> He sa- and he said, hey, when you guys come up here, bring it to my factory. I'll give you as much floor space as you need. I'll set up all the tables you need, and I'll give you a key to the building. For I don't the, know how For your we- sale. Yeah. Well, for the weeks leading up to the sale. Okay. Just dividing it. And then so people also- came in to look at the stuff during those weeks? No. Nobody oh. did. Okay. But when we were all done dividing it up, the stuff we were each going to keep. Between the two of you, uh, then we set up for the sale, and mm-hmm. that was a massive undertaking. We published a catalog, and yeah. oh my God, it was unbelievable. And then we put the word out, Egyptian Hall sale. And it's in uh, New Oxford, Pennsylvania. Go through 20 miles of cornfields, and you'll come to this factory, and that's where it is. In the middle of nowhere. And and if you build it, they will come. Mm-hmm. And people realized there will never be a sale like this as long as I live. And mm-hmm. they came from far and wide. So it was unbelievable. On the Saturday, we had a fixed price sale where everyone came in. It's like we shot off a, a starting gun, to this race into this building. But before you go to that point, you had to have priced these for that fixed this price. Was, these things, hundreds and hundreds of books and magazines and posters were all priced. By you. and By and George and I. You and George. Yeah. And since there wasn't eBay or anything like that, I mean, how did you... People to this day say, how did you guys... That's the question. How did you guys I've heard know this pose before. how to do this? <laughs> and George always said, we're experts. <laughs> and we left it at that. We didn't know any more than anybody else. But anyway, uh, we priced everything and they came in and it was just, they just feasted. To your surprise, stuff. they were paying those prices. They were because, the, and you thought, hmm. All day long, they said, "I'll never see this poster again as long as I live." Yeah, good point. I either buy it today or I never own it the rest of my life. Right. I'll take it. Nor will I see it because it'll be someone's private collection. That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we had these these three sheet portraits, a, th- a three sheet portrait of uh, Keller and a matching kind of three sheet portrait of Thurston, 
printed by Strobridge. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. And at that time, people kind of Stone had, had never seen them. Oh, yeah. They, they'd never seen these Yeah, things. the colors have popped. So you walk in and you go, oh, my God. And they were expensive. Well, they were like $9,000 each or something. You know, and in 10 minutes, somebody said, I'll take both of those. <clears throat> so we took them out, and we had a huge area where you would have your name, and you could start a pile. Okay. And I would drag these over and put them in that guy's pile. Then I would go in the stock room and bring out two more Keller Thurston three sheets and hang them up. And the next guy would say, I'll take those. Oh, my gosh. And I'd put those over in his pile and bring out another pair. Did you ever think about, okay, the next one's going to be 10000 No, next be... we didn't. No? Okay. But they started saying, hang on a second. How many of these have you got behind that door there? <laughs> it's like, this is my last one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I still have a couple. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was a sale that was just unbelievable. And then the, the next day was the auction. And we had... 200 and some really amazing items. That professional auctioneer, or was it someone? It was me. Oh. I'd never done an auction in my life. This was your first auction. You and heard... we thought about getting an auctioneer, yeah. but to an auctioneer, he doesn't know what any of this stuff is. He doesn't know what he's selling. He doesn't care what Good he's point. selling. He's just moving His the price. His goal is to get home in time for dinner, right? Yeah. And, and George and I, this was scary. We needed to make some money. To get you had your life money. savings on the That's line. That's right. So, you and know, Susan and Tina were also probably yeah, there. Saying, Sandy and Tina were very They concerned. were working the calculator. <laughs> they were. They both were. They worked like dogs this weekend. And, uh, you know, and if someone, if, if some poster was at $12,000 and I said, who'll say fourteen? If I could squeeze one more bit out of them, George and I each just made another $1,000. So it mm -hmm. was worth spending another 30 seconds. So we had this uh, auction and it was a lot of fun and people got unbelievable things. If I'd have known how successful it was going to be, I would have taken 50 things off the wall and not sold them. Hmm. Because I've, why? You think they were Because I'll never, I'll never see, see them him again, again okay. and I'd love to own them. So it was, it was a great day. At that time, it was the largest sale of memorabilia in the history of Ephemera. magic. Ephemera yeah. particularly? Yeah. No, everything. Books, apparatus. Apparatus as well? All kinds of apparatus. Really? Tables and props? and Tables and props. Uh, hmm. Absolutely. Because I just remember seeing mostly brochures and, I mean, cards and business cards and photographs no, no, and everything, no, no. As, in addition to the uh, posters, of course. But I don't remember seeing all the... Fantastic props. Hmm. I kept many of the... I mean, I kept Jarrett's Bangkok bungalow and T. Nelson Downs coin ladder and... It was the one that you kept for a long time and finally gave to David for his collection recently, or was that part of that collection? You know what I'm talking about? I thought there was one that I heard you were talking about, and you said, I've kept this long enough, I'm going to... Oh, that might have been the Dante sawing. That was the Dante sawing. That had nothing to do with the gypsum Sorry. hall. But, okay, then. But a great story. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you are full of lots I'm of stories. I'm full of story. That's a great story. <clears throat> I, my 50-year interest in the sawing a lady in half which just resulted in this book this past year. Mm -hmm. a one, wonderful book. And I, uh, my good friend John Daniel, and ironically, I'm interviewing Kathy Daniel, John's wife, tomorrow afternoon at this conference. Mm -hmm. uh, John was good, good friends with Al Jansen, who was Dante's son. Hmm. And John ended up with lots of great Dante things, including Dante's Sawing a Lady in Half. Yep. And one day John said, you should buy this. And I did. I bought Dancy Sawing in Half, and I had it in my basement. And David Copperfield would come over, and he says, oh, you got to sell me this sawing. This is unbelievable. <laughs> he was I drooling. Said, yeah. And I, I always loved saying, David, you can't afford this sawing. You don't have enough money, which drove him crazy. <laughs> come on. Everything's got a price on it. What do you want for this thing? You don't have enough money, pal. It drove him nuts. So then, amazingly, I became friends with Moyo Miller who mm -hmm. was Dante's chief assistant for many, many, many years. Um, and Moyo was a very special lady. And she, with her husband, Arturo, Arturo is the one who built this prop because he worked on Dante's show. Mm -hmm. uh, and at this time, let me see, Moyo was, I think at this time, maybe in her late 70s. Oh. And we were down looking at the Dante sewing, and she goes, wow, you know, I haven't seen this in decades. And, she says she was sawed in half in this box more than 11,000 times. 11,000 yes, times. Yes, and I absolutely believe it. She uh -huh. worked for decades with him. 
And like an idiot, I said, Moyo, do you think you could still do this? Now, this is a 78-year-old lady, and she, be, as soon as the words came out of my mouth, she kicked her shoes off, jumped up on this thing, climbed inside of it, said, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. Wow. And I said, okay, you're booked. We're going to do this at the next Magic History Conference. Uh-huh. She said, okay. So on that fateful night, which honestly is one of the great nights of my life, um, I did a talk about Dante, and and we had Moyo there, and we talked to Moyo, and and that night on the show, the curtain opens, and there's this song that hasn't been on stage since the early 50s, mm-hmm. and out comes Moyo, dazzling. Moyo was one of those very rare people that when she walks into a room, she lights it up like a, a Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. She just glows. And and assisting was Arturo, who used to assist Dante. Hmm. So this night was all about Moyo. And I hypnotized her, and we put her in the box, and we sawed her in half. Yeah. And it was just thrilling. The great thing about that was everybody in this audience at the Magic History Conference, they get it. Sure. They know all about Dante. They know all about Moyo. Moyo. They know mm-hmm. what a historic moment this is. This will never happen again which made it just even better. And then I thought, you know, long after this, I thought, what am I ever going to do with this prop The tops what I've already done? Mm-hmm. Saw Moyo and App. There's nothing you could do. So I thought, you know what? Maybe I'm done with this. You were Dante for the evening. I was kind of Dante. Yeah. For the so I talked to David and said, uh, hey, you still can't buy that prop, but you could trade for it. And he was excited. Yeah. And so he said, come on up and pick out some pick some stuff out and i went up and i picked unbelievable stuff starting with the first edition of the discovery of witchcraft from 1584 which you did not have in your collection not at that point and a ton of other stuff in a wow in addition in Holy addition how but it was all duplicates. David had duplicates sure, of everything. Sure. So for him, it was a good deal. Yeah, when I saw his collection, he was saying, this is one of like seven discoveries I've got. Or yeah, something. I know it. He does have a stack. <laughs> and so uh, so he got Dancy sewing. And last what summer, when we did the collectors up in Las Vegas, yep. Bill Smith's thing, and uh, everybody got a tour of David's museum, I was the tour guide in that the big hall, the the golden age hall that we call it, the Mm -hmm. golden age of magic, uh, which is unbelievable. And in there is Dante's sewing. Hmm. And I explained to people, I said, this thing lived in my basement for over 20 years. Well, that's right. I remember now you were the tour guide for that part. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And I said, more people will see this trick in this incredible setting here in David's museum today than saw it in the 20 plus years that I had it in my basement. So you know what? Mm. It it found its rightful home. It's the right place. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a good place to close this and kind of wrap this up then too. This is great. And I'm glad that you have carried that on. And so the, the museum now resides with you. Um, Part of the deal was David Price III said, what's going to happen to the name Egyptian Hall Museum? Yeah. And George said, well, to be perfectly honest, I'm really not interested in it. I'm just trying to enhance my own collection. Sure. And without thinking about it for five minutes, I said, well, you know, this thing's been around since 1895. I'd be thrilled to be the guy that carried this name on. And David said that was the only right answer. If you had both wanted it, it would be a problem. And if neither of you wanted it, it would be a problem. Wow. But the the fact that one of you does is great. Fate. So, yes, I've now been the curator and owner of Egyptian Hall Museum since 2000. And in perpetuity. Do you have anybody in mind who has come to you and shown interest uh, at this point? Um, lots of people are interested. Yeah. But you know what? Here's what I want. Here, people always ask me that. What's going to happen to this? Um, I'm like Dave Price Jr. I don't care about getting... I'm not going to auction it off and be the guy who breaks up Egyptian Hall Museum. Mm-hmm. I would like to find the guy, uh, the same thing that David Price found. Uh, a guy who will use this collection and publish books out of this collection and share this collection with other people who are interested or doing books. Yeah. Today I got my Molini book, the Steve Cohen book, and mm-hmm. I've got Molini things in there because I'm not going to write a Molini book, and Steve did a beautiful one. Yeah. 
So, yeah, I, I love having my stuff appear in other guys' books. So that's kind of who I'm looking for. Hopefully I've got enough time to find someone. Someone to carry that on. Yeah. You've got a long number of years, uh, my friend. I hope that you could do that. Yeah. So what would be your magic word as we wrap up over here? Something that would be your, not necessarily mantra, but your philosophy of life. What is it that cheers you, wakes you up in the morning? Not setting an alarm clock. I never set an alarm clock, although I did two days ago because I had to get up at 4.15 to fly here. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, you know what? I was walking through the hotel early this morning, and there was a meeting room with you could see into. I saw it, those guys. It, there, And I look at yeah. all those slugs sitting in there, and I yep. go, you know what? Not one person in that room wants to be there. I didn't see many smiles, not you mentioned. No, well, yeah. and everybody at our convention wants to be here. That's the difference. Virgil used to say, you know, when you're m most people that have a job, they uh, they work all year and they get two weeks off to go fishing each year. And when you're a magician, you get to go fishing 52 weeks a year because that's all you want to do. Right. So enjoy your fishing. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Mike, thanks very much. Always a pleasure, Scott. You're a good friend. I appreciate uh, your time, and those stories were phenomenal. Good. And so uh, thanks again, and uh, looking forward to getting to see the music. I missed the opportunity when I was down there, just to happenstance when I was uh, out in Pasadena a few months ago. That's right. And um, you were just going to be taking Chris Hart, and I think and uh, Chris Hendricks and Dave uh, Kaplan were coming over. And and uh, How did you miss out on that? Because I was... I was consulting uh, on Masters oh, of Illusion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. right. And so uh, I was working that day, and then the next day I was going to come over, and then Tina reminded you you had an appointment and said, oh. We that's got, right, we did. Yeah. So Well, the invitation's still there. I'll come in and I'll enjoy that. So so I will be able to report from that in the future, too. So thanks right, again. Good. Appreciate it. All right, Scott. It. So with the Magic Word Podcast. And that was Mike Caveney. This is Scotty Al. Wow. Absolutely and thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, what a great conversation. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, there, uh, man, uh, a wealth of knowledge in so many different directions we could go. And as you could tell, we spun off down several rabbit holes as we were talking uh, today. So thank you for keeping up with me as I was directing and redirecting and uh, just playing tennis back and forth. It was, <laughs> it was great. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, listeners, for uh, tuning in again to this episode number 700. Thank you so much for being with us for all of these episodes and on into the future as well. There are a lot of things coming up here in the near future, which includes uh, a full convention report from each day at uh, Quebec when we will be attending FISM. And then after, right after that, we'll be going to Abbott's Get Together. So there'll be daily reports from that. And then we'll be going to Pose Magic Conference, and so it's just back-to-back, -back. and I want to thank Vince Wilson again for sponsoring this week's episode, and want to encourage everybody to sign up. I just had checked with him before I published this to make sure there is still room, and he says that there is, so be sure and check out the website if you'll just go to posemagicconference.com. And you can find out all the information you need to know and who's going to be there and how you can sign up at the hotel. It's going to be a grand old hotel. It looks pretty cool. Well, listen, thank you again for sticking around for this week's episode. And until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to find a way so that you can live to fish. This is Scotty out. <laughs>